Matthew 15, verses 1 through 28. I titled this morning's message, Inside Out. I actually kind of changed it a couple of times. But essentially, what's going to happen is, is that in this, these passages of Scripture, we're going to observe a comparison and a contrast that's going to take place between a uh, Canaanite woman and also uh, the religious leaders of Israel, which were we, we've grown to know them as the Pharisees. <coughs> certainly there were the Sadducees also, but we speak mostly about the Pharisees. But the specific observation that we should note is that there's a focus taking place on actions. And there are times that we can see certain things going on on the outside, but sometimes what we see can be deceptive, Right. If we look closely from a spiritual perspective, we will learn. Uh, we can learn that what we see outwardly is a reflection of what's really going on inwardly. So I'm talking about inside out. What's going on the inside is manifest outside, right? Uh, sometimes it's easier to see than other times. Uh, I guess you could also look at it as possibly the fact of a spiritual MRI, if there were such a thing that we could take a peek on the inside. But so that's really the underlying theme of what of what really stood out to me with this passage of scripture. I don't know that everything that I'm going to talk about will be directly related back to that. But um, before we get started, I'm just going to draw our little map up here that I normally draw because it has to do just a little bit of having to do with location. I usually don't extend the map up this far. But, uh, you know, the Sea of Galilee and uh, the Jordan River going into the Dead Sea. There's an area here called the Land of Gennesaret. That was another name for, um, for the, the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Gennesaret. And essentially, that's where this particular passage starts off, is that Jesus, after performing a miracle, he crosses over the lake or the Sea of Galilee, and he's in the Land of Gennesaret. And this is where this takes place. So it says in chapter 15, Matthew 15, <coughs> starting at verse 1, and we'll read all the way through 28. It says, then came, Jesus, then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem. So we see already that the conflict that's about to start is that these Pharisees are purposefully coming to Jerusalem to ask some questions. They're here to interrogate Jesus about some things that are going on. And this is what they say. Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? It's important that we see that, that they're focused on the tradition of the elders, right? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Well, I like that right there. You know, sometimes whenever people confront us about particular things in our life, you know, one of the things that I've learned about Jesus, because it's an area of my life that I don't really accomplish very often, is that when people come against me, I have a tendency to, to come back. You know what I'm saying? To give them a what for. And, you know, Jesus did a good job a lot of times of really being quiet, especially at the most important time when they were bringing him to the cross. The Bible prophesied in Isaiah that like a lamb, he opened not his mouth as he was led to the slaughter. He, he didn't try to defend himself. He didn't come against the accusations that were being spoken of against him. At the same time, Jesus didn't just let people go around uh, acting or pretending like they were always right and never correcting particular situations. Right, yeah. And we see this situation taking place right now where... They're wanting to know why he's transgressing the tradition of the elders. He's like, well, hold on a second. Before we get into that, let me ask you a question. Why are you transgressing the commandment of God? You're worried about the tradition of the elders, which we'll get into a little bit more to explain that. But you're breaking the law of God. And then he goes on to explain that. He says, for God commanded, saying, honor your father and mother. And he that curses father or mother, let him die the death. So he's talking out of Exodus there, out of the, one of the commandments where it says to honor your father and your mother. And that there were, you know, the, the result or the penalty of the, not honoring or cursing father or mother was that they would be stoned to death. I mean, there's episodes in the Old Testament where that literally took place. I mean, uh, and so, you know, that's what Jesus is talking about right there. So. He goes on to say, but you say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift. And we'll explain that a little bit more in the book of Mark that uses the word Corbin right there, which is descriptive of a gift that's given to the treasury of the temple or, or for our purposes, we could say the church. So, so you could offer up a gift 
to be given to the church or the temple. And we'll explain because what Jesus is doing here is getting into the motives of people's hearts. Amen. Amen? And, and that's what he's, he's doing. He's exposing what's on the inside. But you say whoever shall uh, get, say to his father, his mother is a gift by whatsoever you might as be profited by me and not honor his father or his mother. He shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So essentially what's going on here. Let me just explain to you real quick. <clears throat> is that there's something maybe that the mother or the father need. But what they're saying is, oh, it's Corbin. What you need right there is Corbin. It's a gift that's been vowed to the temple. And so the idea is, is that if they vowed it to the temple, they could really hold on to it until they gave it to the temple, if they were really going to ever give it to the temple. And so by doing that, then basically they've freed themselves from, from having to take care of their duties or obligations that the law required that they would honor their mother or their father. Thus you have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying this people draw near me unto me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain. They do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. You know, I didn't really put this in my notes to talk about it a whole lot, but I was reading it again this morning, and it stuck out to me that his disciples came to him and said, don't you see that the Pharisees were offended? I'm pretty sure Jesus was perceptive enough to, that if they noticed it, that, that he also noticed that while he was saying what he was saying, because... You know, one of the things that we have to remember, and, and this is just to be fair to all of us, is that whenever we're told something that is true, okay, we don't necessarily like it if it's, if it's exposing or revealing something that's on the inside of us. We don't like it, and, and, and it, and it can sometimes can offend us. We have to learn the difference between the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the condemnation of the enemy, right? Sometimes, and you know, listen, if somebody's trying to share something with you or speak truth to you about something to, to try to help you in the midst of your life, amen, and, and, that, and the Holy Spirit will use that to convict you, to show you something that's going on, that's a good thing. That's, that's a beneficial thing, right? At the same time, people can oftentimes be used by the enemy things that they speak, it might be true, but they're doing it in a harsh way, sometimes even to hurt you, and the enemy will be more than happy to use that as fuel to stoke a fire of condemnation, to cause an oppression to take place on you. So you have to just notice the difference. And it doesn't mean that people are always purposefully trying to condemn, you know, whatever. The Lord will help you figure that out. But one of the things that I will tell you is that just because <clears throat> sometimes when you hear something, if it's true, and you feel bad about it, it doesn't mean that it wasn't the Lord. It doesn't mean that the Lord didn't want you to feel bad about it. And you might get offended, but guess what? Sometimes the truth offends us. Uh, amen? And, and, but, the, but God is trying, wanting to use it to reveal something that's on the inside. All right. He says, uh, but he, then he goes on to talk about leave them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, declare unto us this parable. He said, I need more understanding, Lord. I want to understand the deeper insights of what you're talking about, about what goes in the body is not what defiles it, but actually what comes out of the mouth is what defiles it. And he goes on to say this. This is what Jesus says. Are you also without understanding? Do not ye yet understand whatsoever enters in at the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out in the drought, meaning what you eat, you poop out. OK, for lack of better words. Uh, he, so so what he's but what the, the Pharisees are focused on here is external cleansing. They're focused on something that looks clean and looks spiritually holy because it's going through religious traditions. Oh, we wash our hands very holy before we put our hands on the food to put it in our mouth. 
Jesus says, what's going in your mouth is not what defiles you as far as for eating. Now, we're talking specifically. You can't take this and say, oh, so I can look at pornography and I'll be all right. Because it's not what goes in. It's what comes out. No. He's talking specifically about a religious tradition that has an outward appearance. <clears throat> if you're foolish enough to look at pornography and think that it won't have an effect on your life, it does matter what you put into you. But specifically, we're talking about food. And, and the washing of hands. Jesus said, that's not what's going to defile you. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. Why? Because it's evidence of what's already on the inside of you. Because that's what he says. See, what proceeds out of the mouth comes forth from the heart. And they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defiles not a man. See, many times there's things on the inside of us, on the inside of our hearts, and sometimes we can't even see what's really in there. Until sometimes somebody says something, we don't even know why it is that we got offended, but the reality is, is that that stuff was in there. And, and the Lord wanted to reveal it to us. And, and so sometimes the words that we speak, not just the words that we speak, but the actions that we engage in, they will begin to reveal or tell the story of what's really on the inside. Amen. Jesus, let's go to the next part of the passage that we're reading. So there's kind of a little bit of a change in the action of the story. It says, then Jesus went thence and departed to the coast of Tyre and Sidon. So that's why I wrote these little marks up here. Because he actually left northern Israel and he, walked and he came up here to Tyre and Sidon, which is... Another area of, of Canaan, which was the original name of this place where the Israel, the Jewish people ended up inhabiting. And uh, but he's going to run into this woman here. It says that Jesus went from there and he departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, have mercy on me. O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. You know, real quick now, just to remind you, you know, the Canaanite religion was a very demonic religion. Uh, they, they worshiped Satan, for lack of better words. They were engaging. If we go back to really when we studied the book of Leviticus, when we got into chapters, uh, I didn't really spend a lot of time on it this time because I specifically said I didn't really feel like talking about the occult on that particular night because we've done it so much. But... One of the things that I realize now is, is that God was bringing the children of Israel into the land of Canaan and he was warning them in the book of Leviticus, when you go there, don't do what they do. And it talked about them engaging necromancers, right, which are people that speak to the dead. OK, uh, basically spiritists, which is still alive and well today. They call them familiar spirits, but it's like what they're really doing is they're engaging demon spirits. You ever heard somebody tell you, oh, and I'm not trying to make you feel weird if you didn't know this before, but this is just reality. Sometimes whenever people die, especially people that are in the Catholic religion, they'll feel like they saw their loved one later on. Oh, I saw such and such. That, and, and I've had to say this to people before, and I tried to do it as sweet and as kind as I could. I can't tell you there were never times I kept my mouth shut, but I've had to tell, but I have said to before, you know, another way to look at that is because, see, the Bible says that to be absent from the you know, to be asked for the bodies to be present with the Lord. So we're either going to be with the Lord if we're believers or we're not with the Lord. Our spirit's not wandering around aimlessly on, on earth and it's not stuck in purgatory. You're either with the Lord or you're in torment. And really and truly what's happening is, is that a demon spirit is disguising itself. And that's why they call it a familiar spirit, because it shows up as someone that you knew before. Right. Because if you reveal what he really looked like. You wouldn't be too happy to see him. And so that's what a necromancer was. And that's what the that's what the people of Canaan were doing. They were engaging in necromancy, but they were also doing weird stuff like boiling a baby goat in its mother's milk. I don't know what that's all about, but it was some kind of an occult ritual. God said, don't boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. OK, uh, don't mix seeds because there was a, we won't get into all the mixing stuff because it's just too deep right now. But it had to do with occultic type stuff. Don't partake of the blood. The Jehovah's Witnesses completely twisted that and went somewhere else with it. And they say you can't take a blood transfusion. That's not what it's talking about. You know, and the first time that I ever realized that was when I was in an, a, a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness. And I had read it before, but it never stuck out to me. And as soon as they said that, I said, hold 
hold on a second. The reason God was coming against that was because that was a cult ritual. And then the more I stood it, studied it, there it was right there. Don't partake of the blood for I've given you blood to make atonement for your soul. See, the, the demon spirits are always trying to, to counterfeit and to pervert <laughs> the work and the plan of God. And so therefore they would take the blood and make it something that was unholy, right? What is my point? My point is that's what they're practicing up here. This is what she's been practicing. The result of her religion has left her child demon possessed. And now she's desperate. And so when Jesus goes up to that part of the country, you know, this is not just a happenstance accident. This made it into the Bible, right? Same thing with the Samaritan woman. The Bible says that Jesus must needs go through Samaria. They, they did, Jewish people didn't like traveling through Samaria because they didn't like the Samaritans. But the, Jesus was compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Samaria so they could have an encounter with the Samaritan woman. And in a similar way, Jesus is being moved upon to go into this region and hear this woman who is in a desperate situation. The word of Jesus has already gone before him. People are already aware of what he can do and she's desperate. And so she comes out to him and she says, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. And now listen, that means a lot right there. When she says thou son of David, it might not mean a lot to you, but the word is out. He is the fulfillment of what the Jewish people have been trying to tell us about for a long time. The Jewish people have been in this area now for, you know, a couple of thousand years. The word of Abraham, you know, had gone out. The exodus has taken place. The people of Israel have been here and they've been saying that Messiah was going to come and show up one day. And she's addressing him as the Jewish Messiah. She's addressing him as the, the you know, that's why I was saying earlier whenever I was praying. Whenever there's people that you know that have experienced death. We prayed for some people this morning. I don't know what their religious affiliation is, but you know people who, who don't really know the Lord. But yet at the same time, whenever they experience desperate situations, they've heard of Jesus before. I remember one time whenever I went to my grandmother's house, they lived in Lake Arthur, Louisiana, and my, uh, my, my grandmother had been diagnosed with emphysema, and her, her health just continued to deteriorate. But uh, at this time, she was, you know, able to sit up in her own home, and she did a lot of reading. She was a real smart woman, and she did a lot of reading. And I could, I remember every time I saw her, she would read. She was very quiet, really, truly didn't want to rattle her cage too much because she'd say mean things to you. I mean, one time she called me fat. <laughs> I was like, whoa, mom and grandma called me fat. But you know what? She was telling the truth. <laughs> she was trying. I don't know why she said it like that, but anyway, it was, that's another story. But so I found what she, later on after she walked away, I went and I found what she was reading. And it was this article about Jesus. And it was talking, is Jesus really the way? Is Jesus the one? My point is, is that she was getting near the end. And, and even though she had been in religion, she was, she was searching. In her mind, she was wondering. You know, And I want you to know that, yeah, she had been connected to religion, but there's a lot of people that haven't been connected to any religion. But when they find themselves in desperate situations and they've heard of Jesus, they will call upon him. And she's in a desperate situation. She's heard of Jesus and she calls upon him and she says, oh, Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. You remember the story in the book of Acts whenever that, that woman who had the spirit of divination. I don't know if y'all remember that or not, but it's actually like a spirit of Python. She had, she was uh, practicing this necromancy stuff. It just so happens that we were just talking about. She was in game, but she was demon possessed. And so she would be able to tell people about their future or tell them about various things because the demons that she had connected herself to would give her that information. And so she was getting paid. She got paid. You know, you would pay her a service and then she would tell you what, what it was that you wanted to hear. And then but somebody owned her services. Right. So she had a master. And so she was following the, uh, Paul and Silas around. And, you know, after a while, Paul got tired of it because she was saying the truth. You know, she was saying the truth. She was saying, oh, these men be of the living God. So what she was saying was true. Sometimes demons tell the truth. But Paul got tired of it, and at one point in time, he rebuked her, right? And the spirit came out of her, and then she lost her power. 
And then her master was all mad, if you remember. They threw Paul and Silas in prison. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that this is kind of like a similar situation. I mean, the woman's not demon-possessed. But I want you to get a picture. She's still following him around. And she's saying, son of David. Jesus didn't even respond to her. He just keeps on walking. He's traveling to where it is that he's going to do his work. And then she continues to cry out, son of David. And finally, the disciples are like, Lord, you need to send her away. She do something like answer her, fix the problem, make her go away. She's causing a chaos. She's causing trouble. Right. So so the truth, though, is you remember the time that Jesus also said this, like there was a wicked judge, but that woman kept knocking. She kept knocking and she kept asking. Right. See, the Lord hears the cry of the hurting. And when you're persistent towards the Lord, amen, he's going to respond to your cry. So they're saying, send her away. She cries after us, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that's how he responds to her. <clears throat> I'm not here for you. I'm here for the lost sheep of Israel. Now we're going to break this down a little bit because I always really perceive this the wrong way. And as we keep going, it seems even worse, worser if it could be a word, that Jesus it almost seems like he's getting downright mean towards her. Okay, but we'll, we'll see. Jesus is never really mean, right? He might, he might poke those Pharisees in the eye, but he's not going to do that to this woman. He says, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Now, I want you to, I'm not going to break it down yet, but I want you to see what she did now was she did this number here. Lord, please help me. When it says she came and worshipped him, that's what she did right there. She prostrated herself. On the ground in worship and reverence and bowed before him and said, Lord, please help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat. In other words, it's not proper. It's not a good thing to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Whoa. <laughs> and she said, truth, Lord, this is true. What you're saying is exactly right. I get it. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Something really powerful just took place in that exchange. You know, I mean, Jesus' response to what he told, Jesus telling her a particular thing, but then her response to him. Whatever that really meant right there, you know, it's kind of hard for us to understand and all the cultural disconnection that we have between their language and their understandings and their idioms and what they believed about dogs and all this other kind of stuff. But something very powerful just took place there. Something that was in her was revealed outwardly to Jesus. And because of her response to what it was that he did, he reached down and he touched her. First thing I want to talk to you about, I guess I would break this down into two main points. And point number one is called fake faith. <laughs> fake faith. And it's based upon the first part of the passage that we read regarding the Pharisees. Point, sub point number one under fake faith is deceptive doctrine. Teachings that make people look or feel good outwardly but don't do anything to the heart. You hear, you hear what I'm saying? Deceptive doctrine teaches people <coughs> that... Thing is that it's important for things to look good on the outside, but it doesn't really do anything to the inside of a heart to cause a real change of anything. I know that there's a scripture that we used a while back where I, in Isaiah, and, and I've mentioned it to you that there was a guy that sung the song, and he, and he said, he, he said, don't, he said, he talked about rending your heart. God said in, through the prophet Isaiah, don't rend your garment, rend your heart. Right. And many times people are putting on an outward display of religion. But what God's wanting to do is want to get to the inside. Amen. And so time, many times we cover things up on the outside of our life that prevents the Lord from really reaching in and doing the work that needs to be done on the inside. Deceptive doctrines teach that people <coughs> look good or, or feel good outwardly, but they don't do anything to the heart. Jesus told the Pharisees transgress. You transgress the commandment of God by your tradition. You're going through a whole bunch of religious works. You're doing a whole lot of stuff on the outside. But what you're doing by keeping your tradition at the same time, you're transgressing the very word of God. God commanded saying, honor your father and mother. 
See, this deceptive doctrine results in pride. It deceives a person into thinking that they're doing good with God because they're going through the motions of religion, but the motives of the heart are impure. Yet Jesus is trying to get to the motives. We're trying to see what's on the inside. We want the inside to come out. So they're walking around real religious and holy and righteous. Listen to me. If you got a heart for the Lord, if God has ever reached in and ever touched you, then you have to have been able to see in your own life at some point in time the religion of the Pharisees in your own life. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. The preacher's not the only one that's ever dealt with self-righteousness. Each and every one of us in our life have looked down on other people. We've looked at what it is that we do, the outward tradition and the religion that we do, and we feel like we do it right towards God and that we can look at other people on the side of us and we can look at them and look down on them and say, hmm, I'm glad I don't do it like them. It's a deceptive doctrine, that false doctrine that talks about the outward show. Listen, you can come to church and I hope you do come to church. But just us coming to church, isn't, it, that's, that can be just outward motives. It, it, it's not really revealing what's truly on the inside. It doesn't mean that because you're faithful to church that something's wrong on the inside. I hope you get what I'm saying. We can go through the motions of religion. We can paint a face on. We can put a little smile on. We can act like everything's okay. But the reality of it is, is God is wanting to get to the inside of the heart and to deal with, all, with what's on the inside of us. In the first part of the passage that we read, the religious leaders came all the way from Jerusalem to call the disciples into question. And once again, it wasn't an issue of eating with physically dirty hands. Instead, this is what we're talking about, an outward religious work that was made up by man, taught by man, and then practiced by man as though it were actually from God. This Later on, this oral tradition was known as the Mishnah, which they would say actually came from Moses. The oral tradition, they say, came from Moses and they passed it down generation after generation until it was finally written down in something known as the Mishnah. And the rabbis would say they had added it to the law. You've heard me say this before if you do a New Testament survey class, that by the time Jesus walked on the face of the earth, over 600 new rules and doctrines were added to the law that had already been given. Yeah. And so essentially what they were doing is they were trying to make new rules and new doctrines to make yourself look more holy. Churches still do that today. You know, we don't wear shorts because shorts are less holy than long pants. Women don't wear pants because women ought to wear dresses. Well, I've seen some women wear dresses, not just dresses, but long dresses, but yet it was made out of sheer fabric, and you could basically see their body if the sun hit it just right. And it's almost like they kind of wanted you to see their body because if not, they would have had a different material on the dress. So the point is, is that you can try to look real holy and not cut your hair and let hair, if you're a woman, grow under your armpits. If that's going to make you more holy, that's what they do. They, they don't wear makeup on their body. Now, if you're European, I'm not trying to offend you for our European friends, all 17 of you that watch the videos. Uh, and, you know, listen, I'm, what I'm trying to say is this, is that that can look real holy on the outside. But the reality of it is, is that the Lord told David, I'm sorry, he told uh, Samuel, it was Samuel, right? Not Nathan, Samuel, I'm shooting from the hip, to go and anoint the next king, right? And what he told him was, he said, don't look at his appearance. I'm shooting from the hip here. I didn't put this in my notes. I know it's in the book of Samuel, and I'm sure it's probably the prophet Samuel. But the point is, is this. He said, he said, go and anoint the next king. And he said, don't look at his appearance. Because you remember, I've said this before, Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else in the camp. So he was tall and stately. He looked the part of a king. Well, we don't need to get into all this, but a lot of them kings from them other countries were probably Nephilim. Saul was the tallest one they had in the camp. He looked the part. Eliab, the oldest boy, was tall and handsome too. David was just a little ruddy, cheek-faced boy in the field of sheep. <coughs> God said, don't look at his stature or his appearance. Man looks at the outward. I look at the heart. Man's over here worried about being, this, the, getting influenced by these deceptive doctrines that make religion look as though it's, but it's just an outward work that's never really doing a work to the heart. And that's one of the things about the message of the cross. See, whenever you are under deceptive doctrine, you can be influenced into thinking that what the emotions that you're going through is really Christianity. 
oh, we go to church, we, you know, we do our fellowship thing, but we're just going through motions. No, the truth of the gospel will cause the Holy Spirit to reach into your heart and pinpoint the areas of your life. Amen. And you got a choice. You can either resist it and you can ignore it, or you can let the Lord begin to deal with it. Amen? Amen. And if you let the Lord deal with it, hallelujah, then the work of Calvary will take place. Praise God. How does the Calvary work? Well, Calvary kills things. Amen. The hill upon Calvary was where the cross was. The cross is a sacrifice. Sacrifices die. The cross in your life, whenever things are revealed to you, will be put to death. But the good news is there's a death side of Calvary and there's a resurrection side of Calvary. Things that die at the cross, new life is replaced. Amen. Hallelujah. Resurrection life is there for the believer. All right. And so that's the difference. Deceptive doctrine, though, is just going through all this oral tradition. But Jesus handled the situation. He, he immediately put the switch on. He's like, no, you're over here worried about the moral tradition. Let's get down to the point here. Why are you transgressing the word of God? And his example, once again, was honoring mother and father, right? And, and he said, you're saying, oh, it's Corbin. Sorry. It's almost like if, if somebody in the, if mama said, Matthew, I need a bed. Or not, not, not say Matthew. Let's not use me as an, as an example. But let's just say uh, somebody else. We don't have to use a name. Okay. Their mama said, honey, I need a bed. My, the spring in my mattress is poking me in the back. Whatever it is, because what this text said was, whatever it is that you would have profited by me, it's Corbin. It's, it's a gift for the temple. So I can't really give it to you. I'm, I'm in the clear because, see, I'm giving it to the temple. See? But, then, but like you said, you can hold on to it. So you're saying you're giving it to the temple. It sounds real holy, but really the motives of your heart is you just don't want to give it up. You probably got that bed in an extra room and you're not even sleeping on it, but you don't want to give it up because you like that bed and you can care less about your mama having a spring in her back. Because your motives are wrong. Oh, Pastor Matt needs the bed in his office so when he gets tired, he can go lay down and take a nap. It's for the temple. Corbin. No, it's showing the motives of the heart and it's revealing that something is it right? See, once they said it was for the church, they could keep it for themselves. And so the main point that I'm trying to make is that Jesus is revealing the heart. He's revealing the motives of the heart. They're looking at outward actions, but Jesus is letting us know, no, many times there's things going on on the inside and you're only seeing little signs and symptoms. We'll get into that a little bit more. But in John 4, 23, just to talk about the heart real quick, <clears throat> John 4, 23 this is where Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman. Just to scratch real quick. He says, but the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth. For the father seeks such to worship him. God's desiring to make a spiritual connection with mankind. Yeah. Man's sin has spiritually separated him from the heart and presence of God. God's plan is to restore man into that spiritual condition where he can be in communion with him. When the Holy Spirit is in communion with you, listen to me, then he will begin to reveal to you the things that are in your heart that are not right. Psalm 51, 6. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you shall make me to know wisdom. This is, this is David after he sinned with Bathsheba. And he's crying out to the Lord. He's saying, Lord, I need you to change me. I need you to do a work on the inside of me. I know what you want. What you want is truth on the inward parts. My spirit, man. You want me to come clean with you. You don't want me hiding the motives Amen. of my heart and pretending that everything's okay. You want me to let it out. And you want me to allow it to be exposed to you, Lord, so that you can deal with it. Amen. Now, through the whole process, we were promised this, that in the hidden part, you shall make me to know wisdom. Hallelujah. To learn the wisdom of God. See, there's always hope. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you've experienced, no matter how bad it may seem, truth be told, if you'll hold on to the Lord and you'll allow him to have his way in your life, then if nothing else, you're going to gain wisdom from God. Amen. Amen. Point number, sub point number two under fake faith is deceptive doctrines lead to failure and lostness. I don't know. I guess that's a word. It didn't try to correct it. Deceptive doctrines lead to failure and lostness. This is what Jesus told the Pharisees. Let them, I'm sorry, to his people. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. 
The idea here is that kind of like the wheat and the tares. You remember the story of the wheat and the tares, the parable? Well, we talk about that a lot, right? A tare was a poisonous plant that looked very much like wheat. And just until the very end, that's when you knew it wasn't really wheat. But then by that time, they're like, what should we do? Should we go pull them up? Jesus said, no, nope, you got to just let them grow together. And in the harvest, we won't separate it. You can't go over there because if you start trying to rip up tares out of the midst of the church or out of the kingdom, oh, you're a tear. Oh, oh I didn't mean to point any particular word. In fact, you're a tear. You're going to get up and get out of this house. No, hold on a second. Because when you do that, guess what? There's people that might not have perceived them to be tares. And, when, and, and people that were actually good believers. And, and then now that you've ripped the tear up, now you're, you're messing up some of the wheat. But not only that, who are you to say who's a tear and who's a weed? Maybe you're the tear preacher. Maybe you need to get uprooted and get out of here, right? The point that I'm trying to make is, is that it's the Holy Spirit's work and it's the Holy Spirit's job that discerns all of that. And on the day of harvest, he's the one that's going to sort it all out. Amen? And so you can't even really, uh, you won't be able to stop it all. You can't even really prove who is or isn't based on the outward actions. Like, the outward actions, sometimes they're very obvious. Like Jesus said, out of what, what comes out of the mouth is what defiles a man. Sometimes it's real obvious. Sometimes it's not that obvious. <laughs> Many times all you see are little signs and symptoms that tell a bigger story. I mean, I, sometimes, you, you, sometimes you'll just be talking to somebody and the least little thing that they say or the way they respond to a particular thing, it's like you get a check in your spirit. Mm -hmm. Something's not right with that. But it's not really enough evidence to really write them off, say, to write them off and to say that they're a tear. OK, uh, you know, it's kind of like in, it's similar to medicine is how I would look at it. You know, there's little signs and symptoms. A sign is something you can see. A symptom is something somebody tells you about. Take all that information together and you formulate a diagnosis. Right. Sometimes the signs and symptoms can mimic other things. As somebody comes in with a red throat, strawberry tongue and fever and a sore throat. Oh, well, you know what? That could be strep throat. But guess what? It might not be strep throat. Sometimes you got to wait a little bit longer. You put them on antibiotics, and next thing you know, five days later, they're still running fever. they got red eyes, and their fingers are peeling. Strep throat can cause fingers to peel, too. But antibiotics should have killed it after three. So what's going on? They could have Kawasaki disease, okay? That's a whole other story for another time. I've only seen it once in 21 years. But my point is, similar signs and symptoms but you put all this information together and it results in something. But sometimes the signs and symptoms are vague. And sometimes the Lord show you. The point is, is that you can't always make a true diagnosis based on what. So like he said, you can't just write them off. Amen. You got to allow things to continue. You can't get into actually That's what I put. You can't try to get rid of everybody in the church that you think is poisonous like a tear. And you can't spend all your time. This is important for all of y'all here. For all of us, including the preacher. Okay. You can't always spend your time also trying to convince people that their teachers are going to run them off the road and into a pit. Now, Jesus came against false doctrine. Jesus told his disciples. Now, one of the things that we have to understand is, is that he's telling his disciples this. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven of the Pharisees was their false teachings and their doctrines. They want to be seen by the eyes of men, but on the inside, their, their cup is unclean. All right. Jesus warned against that to his disciples. Have you ever tried <laughs> to warn somebody that liked Joel Osteen about Joel Osteen? <laughs> I'm just asking the question. Because, yeah. look, if you're ready for a fight, buddy, go ahead. <laughs> Have you ever tried to warn somebody about Rick Warren that likes Rick Warren? I'm sorry if I offended you. And that's not what I'm trying to do. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is you're not going to convince everybody. And if it's somebody that you're not really close to, you might kind of be wasting your time anyway. The Lord said, listen, the blind is going to lead the blind. If people want to follow after, I'm not saying if you have a relationship with them and you care about them and you can speak into their life, that you don't try to make them aware and warn them. That's not what I'm getting at. I'm just saying, don't try to fix every situation and try to save every single circumstance because the truth be told is that you're not going to be able to con. Jesus said this. He said, if it wasn't planted by my father, it will be uprooted. Amen. God in the end is going to take care of it all. Right. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all have tried to warn people and only to no avail. The truth is that false doctrine <clears throat> will result in people getting lost. If a person isn't taught how to properly access the grace of God through proper daily faith in Christ, 
then they will ultimately fall, <coughs> and this is the problem, and possibly never get back up. A person that is taught how to properly follow the Lord, he, may, they, he or she may fall, but they will be equipped to right the ship, for lack of better words, because they have the right coordinates or know the direction they need to go. Can you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16? We're talking about the fact that deceptive doctrines lead to, uh, lead to lostness and, and, and a deception and cause people to become blinded by external religion. I love this passage of Scripture. It's kind of long, but real quick, we'll try to make quick of it. It says, He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. This is talking about, if you look in the Greek, the idea is these are gifts that Jesus gave to the church. Jesus is getting at this different than the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are gifts of Jesus. He's given this to the body of Christ. He's giving them apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting or the maturing of the saint. The true call of God on a person's life, the result of that, doesn't make them elevate them higher than the people in the church. What it does is it puts a, it puts a responsibility on them to do what God has asked them to do, which is to speak his truth to the people that they might be equipped so that they might mature in the ways of the Lord. It says so that they might be matured. That's what the word perfecting there for the work of the ministry. Ultimately, God wants to do a work in you so that he can do a work through you. Right. Yes. For the edifying of the body of Christ. It means the building up. It's like the body of Christ would be like a building and there's work, architectural work. It's actually an architectural term from what I remember studying a long time ago. And it's being built up. And so God uses the gifts of the church to speak forth the truth so that the body of Christ can be built up, come to the place of maturity, so that it can function properly and accomplish what it is that God's called it to do, to do the work and to, and to speak truth to a lost and dying world. Amen? Amen? It says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, another way to say a mature man, Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, we're supposed to be growing up, becoming grown ups in the faith, and looking more like Jesus. Uh, that we henceforth be no more children. So we're supposed to be grown ups and not like children. Children in the faith spiritually, being tossed to and fro, like a ship without a rudder, not knowing which direction that we're going. Why? Because carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight, slight of men. It's, that word is cubia. It describes a, 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 where we get the word cube for dice. <clears throat> so it's, it's like a trickery thing. False doctrine is deception. Blinds people to the truth. Causes people to lose their way, their coordinates. Causes them to become lost. It says that in cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in deceit, but speaking the truth and love may grow up into him. So when we speak the truth in love, we grow up in Christ in all things, which is the head. He's the head. We're the body, right? From whom the whole body fitly joined together. So we get the picture of a building again. And a building is only as strong as its foundation and the structure that lies within it. And so the kingdom of God and the body of Christ is being fitted to be a building and that it be structurally sound. And what gives us structural soundness is... Is proper understanding and, and proper doctrine, not false doctrine that deceives and leads to lostness. And compacted means put together by that which every joint supplies. You supply something to the body of Christ. Even if you just showing up over here, I believe that. You can say whatever you want, but I'm telling you, you just showing up. Now, now you're, you're, you're uh, discrediting your own self, preacher. Because earlier you said just coming to church, it could be an extra. Yeah, it could be. But at the same time, sometimes just showing up to church and not forsaking the gathering of the brethren and being present in the body of Christ. My point is, is that we need you to show up. We need you to show up and to do your part because we're all part of a structure. Amen. Amen. And, and, and we're all part of, 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 of doing what it is that God has called us to do. The purpose of the ones that are called to speak the truth. To allow the body to be edified, to be built up, amen, to do the work of the ministry. And like the tossing, see, the proper doctrine will prevent, will cause the tossing to stop and the growing to start, amen? That's what proper doctrine will do. It'll cause the tossing, the loss of coordinates, the lostness of false doctrine. It's going to stop. 
And now the growing can start. You can't grow in Christ until you're exposed to the truth of the gospel. Amen. And that the truth of the gospel begins to do a work in your life. The child of God will be able to stand up in the face of adversity and mature in the Lord. This results in a stronger church because God's people become focused on allowing him to change their hearts. And when their hearts are changed, they begin to focus on his work. Point no, sub point number three under point number one, talking about fake faith. Outward actions reveal what's really in the heart. Outward actions reveal what's really in the heart. This is what Jesus said. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. Peter wanted a further explanation. He's like, Lord, what, what is going on? Well, Jesus is explaining that a man is not defiled by what goes into his mouth, but rather his defiled condition is evidenced by what comes out of his mouth. His defiled condition is evidenced by what comes out of his mouth or the actions that come forth from his life. When you see something that takes place you, you, uh, in a person's life that's evidence on the outside, that just shows you that there, that there was something that was already in there. Amen? What we like to do is, is that when we catch them, we like to say, uh-huh. <laughs> I knew that was there the whole time. Well, guess what? There was something in you too. And the truth of the matter is, is this, is that maybe it never was manifested outwardly for everybody to see, but there was something in you. You weren't pristine and white and, and, and holy because there was something on the inside of you that wasn't right. Whether it was self-righteousness, it might not have been as bad as the guy next door. Nevertheless, you weren't all that, right? And we know that because the Word of God teaches us that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it, right? So Peter wanted a further explanation. And, and, and the Lord's showing us, that, listen, we're getting to the motives of the heart. We're trying to, to show that, that it's what's on the inside of a man. And, and, and what he meant by that is that the heart of man and his motives are revealed by his words or his actions. Once again, sometimes it's hard to tell because you might just get a little snippet. You might just see a little something, something. It's like, man, something just doesn't feel right about that, but I can't put my finger on it. But sometimes it's real obvious. But this is what James said, James 1, 13 through 15. <coughs> he said, <coughs> let no man... James 1, 13 through 15. Let no man say when he is tempted. So the word tempted there also can mean to be put to the test. I am tempted of God. God does allow tests to take place in our life, but God never puts evil in our life. God will allow the enemy to set a trap, but it's not God setting the trap. It's the enemy that he's giving leeway to set the trap. OK, and so he says, don't don't say that God did it because God cannot be tempted with evil, evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, his own lust. He owns it. The word lust means desire. It's a it's a deep craving for something. It can be a deep craving for something good. You can lust after the Lord or it can be a deep craving for something bad. But the point is, is that it was your lust. It was already on the inside of you. It was there, right? And when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So there's the, there's the bait. It's enticing you. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. The word conceived there literally means to be imprisoned. Whenever that lust, whenever that test arrives and you begin and, and it begins to stimulate that thing that was already on the inside of you, when you give into it at some point in time, what ends up happening is you become in prison to that thing. See, when we're faced with a test, there's an opportunity to resist or persist. Joseph was smart enough to run. But I got to tell you that just because Joseph ran doesn't mean that he was set free just because he ran is the point I'm trying to make. Just because you run doesn't mean you're set free. Only the Lord can truly set you free. Amen? I'm not, what I know Aaron was talking about this the last time he was in. Just because you run, in other words, he said, Joseph had to have run to the Lord 
to say, because listen, I don't know what Potiphar's wife looked like. Look, if she wasn't pretty, it might have been easy. Take off running, dude. I ain't never coming back to that place again. That would be crazy. But if she was, if she was pretty or if there was something connected to her that made Joseph want her, he might have run five miles down the road. But in his mind, the enemy would use that to work on him to try to get him to go back. Right. And, and so but so there's a time to resist or persist. But if you stay in contact long enough with something that your heart desires, at some point, lust is conceived. Once again, the word there literally means to be ensnared or to be imprisoned. And now you can have fun because it never ends up the way that you expected that it would. It never finishes the way you envisioned it in your mind. All right. So those were the three points to point number one, which was fake faith. Now we're going to point number two, which is the main point number two, which is true faith. In the next part of the chapter, Jesus moved northward and crossed the path of that Syrophoenician or Canaanite woman. If you look at two different, the gospel, there's different gospels that talk about this particular story. It's the same story. One gospel calls it the Canaanite woman, one a Syrophoenician woman, which is that area. She was of the offspring of these people. We already talked about the fact that she was in a desperate situation because her previous practices, the text doesn't tell us that, but if you know the history of it. Her previous religious practices have caused her daughter to become demon possessed. So there's one thing that we're talking about actions, <clears throat> right? We're talking about inside out. We're talking about a spiritual MRI. What we saw from the Pharisees was that externally they're trying to look holy and religious, but internally their motives are dirty and impure. And now we're looking at true faith. And point number one under true faith is that true faith is often desperate. She cries out, have mercy on me. And the Lord responds, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. So, the, so, so she hears the words that Jesus says, but she says, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I'm not going to stay in this particular situation. I'm desperate. My daughter's in a bind. I need the Lord to reach down and to touch this particular situation. She laid down. She prostrated herself. And she began to worship him. Amen. She, the, the disciples had made her feel like she was a nuisance. Some people would try to tell her that she wasn't worthy of the Lord's time. Right? And even some of what he said may be perceived that way. But she wasn't discouraged enough by what she said to turn around and to leave. Instead, it made her press in even more, right? And even when it seemed like maybe Jesus wouldn't answer, she persisted. The word worship there is proscunio. It means to prostrate oneself. But listen to this. I was thinking after I started studying this, I wonder if, I wonder if it's her actions that caused Jesus to now go into the words that he said. Because the word in the Greek language, what it literally meant was like a dog licking the hand of its master. It's like, I know that that sounds kind of like crazy, but that word worship that's translated in the New Testament time and again is descriptive of a dog licking its master's hand. It's almost like, and I know sometimes that's hard for us to, to come to realization with because nobody wants to be considered a dog like licking his master's hand. But what, if you can imagine a good dog that loves its master and it's sitting there at its master's side and it's sitting crouched in a position and it's just waiting for its master to tell it what to do, and it loves its master so much that it's licking its hand, right? And that's really the idea. It's, it's a, a dog doesn't know any better because, I mean, you know, half the time its masters aren't really all right. <laughs> but, but a dog doesn't know any better. It just loves its master, right? And so a person that's really, things may not always be going right in their life. Sometimes situations are desperate. But this particular situation, he, he adores his master, he lays him, his life down for his master. He waits to hear the words of his master. Psalm church, uh, so we're talking about desperate faith. Psalm 34, 18. It says, The Lord is near unto them that are of a broken heart and saves such as be of a contrite spirit. The word contrite literally means to be ground up like dust. Broken and ground up. She's desperate and she's crying out to the Lord and her actions are showing what it is that's going on in her life. Let's look at Psalm 51, 17. Same Psalm, David writing again after the situation. 
It says the sacrifices of God. You want to give a sacrifice to the Lord? This is what the psalmist has come to the realization. You want to give a sacrifice to the Lord? This is what you do. He says, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart of God, you will not despise. Mm -hmm. God is looking, <laughs> his eyes roam to and fro upon the earth, looking for a broken and a contrite spirit. The word of God says that he won't despise it. That's different. Her, what's being manifested or being shown outwardly in her life is different than what's being manifested by the Pharisees. You see this. The actions of the Pharisees are external. What's going on is that she's desperate from her heart. That was point number one. Sub point number one. Sub point number two is true faith is willing to accept God's will and not its own. That was worth, hey, that right there was worth repeating. True faith is willing to accept God's will and not its own. He says, but he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. And she said, truth, Lord. What you said is true. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Truth be told, she was never going to sit at the table. She was never going to sit at the table, but she could eat the crumbs. Well, that's a fine how do you do? Exclamation point. That's a fine how do you do? I don't want nobody's crumbs, but if it's God's will that you get crumbs today, are you willing to accept what he's offering? Amen. See, the reason why this whole conversation is taking place is because of the time frame where we are in salvation history. If we don't understand the concept of salvation history, we read this story, we think, golly, Jesus was rude to that woman. I thought he came for everybody. No, hold on a second. We're in the midst of salvation. Jesus came to offer salvation to his own people. But his own people rejected him. He was light that came in the midst of darkness. But his own people had the Roman soldiers crucify him. But good news, good news is coming today when a Canaanite woman in 2017 can come to the Lord in a desperate situation. Never had known the Lord. And now she gets to sit at the table. Yeah. This woman right here ain't never going to get to sit at the table. It just happens to be where she is in the time frame of history. Okay, but let's look a little bit closer. She was never going to sit, but the question is, are you willing to accept what he's offering today? See, for a long time, I really misunderstood this passage of Scripture. I knew that it wasn't what it seemed like. I knew that Jesus wasn't just being mean to this woman. I knew that because I, know, I, know, I don't know everything about the Lord, but I know a little, enough about the Lord to know that he's gracious and he's kind and he's merciful and he's true. And the only people that he ever really picked on, if you want to call it that, was those religious people that thought that they had it figured out. The Lord was always about the people that were broken and hurt. Right? There's different words for dog in the Greek language. And, and, and the Jewish people had some really negative views about dogs. Here's some scriptures that talk about that. Matthew 7, 6. In Matthew 7, 6 it says, Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we've talked about what the swine is like. Right? <laughs> if you try to throw pearls in a pig pen, what is, what is a pig going to do with pearls? He's just going to stomp his stuff in the mud and, and just look and look for some food that he can eat, right? Stick his snout back up in the slop. You don't cast pearls before a swine. Jesus said that. Same thing with the dogs, because they're dirty. Dogs are dirty. You get the picture, as, as we continue to read these scriptures, you need to get a picture of this old mangy mutt. It's got some old coarse, nasty hair with some bald spots on it, just running around, looking around, looking for something that it can scavenge and some scraps that it can get. Because that's the idea we're talking about here. Luke 16, 19 through 21. We're talking about here the prodigal son. No, I'm sorry, not the prodigal son. We're talking about Lazarus. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. That's kind of gross, huh? He's just sitting there. He's all messed up. He's got sores all over his body. One of these mangy mutts that's just running around. Because this, this is one of the words for dog that's like talking about something dirty. And just runs up there and it's like... 
I don't know, maybe the dog had some compassion, but you get the point. It's a, talking about a dirty. Look, this, this one's more clear right here. Philippians 3.2. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. The Apostle Paul is doing a play on words in the Greek language here because concision means mutilator and he's comparing it to circumcision. He's talking about circumcision. True circumcision was a work of the heart that's done when you place faith in Christ that a surgical procedure, if you will, for the Holy Spirit is done to your heart. Concision means mutilators. It means they're just cutting stuff off, right? Because it was a work of the flesh. But, but he's comparing them to dogs. Now, this word dog right here that we just read, all of them, metaphorically, it means a man of an impure mind. Okay, so it's a very negative connotation connected to a dog, right? But the word dog used by Jesus is different in this story that we're reading. And the only time it's used in the New Testament is in the different Gospels where it's talking about this specific story. So if you look up this particular word dog in the New Testament, the only time you're going to be seeing it used is whenever Jesus says this to this Canaanite woman. Matthew 15, 26 is what we've been reading. But, she, but he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. This particular word for dog means puppy or a little dog. Can you say aw? <laughs> I mean, I'm not much into all cutesy, whatever, but I mean, that's just kind of cute. It's like a little puppy. It's a little dog. See, it means that it's a little dog or a puppy. And essentially what Jesus was saying is I've come to bring grace to the children of Israel to offer salvation to God's people. I've come and I've fulfilled God's promise that he gave to Abraham. And it's just not right for me to take the plate away from the child that's sitting at the table. Listen to me. If you're sitting over here, how many people got a dog in your house? All right. Thank you. Are you going to take... Now, you might have done it if you was like my daddy to make a point, but if you're not like my daddy, are you going to take the plate of food away from your child and put it on the floor for the dog to eat? No. <coughs> but what you might do when nobody's looking, right, is to take some of the, some of the food and to feed it to the little puppy underneath the table to, to give him a little something, something, right, to make him happy. Why would you do that? Hey, you love your dog. You love your puppy, right? You love your puppy. Okay? And that's essentially what's going on. Jesus is saying, it's not right for me to take the plate of food away from the child, Israel, the one to whom the promises were given, and to give it to the little puppy dog. And she's, her response is, of course you don't do that, Lord. Uh, uh, you would never take the plate away from your child. You would never take food out of your child's mouth, but you'd feed your puppy. You'd feed your little pet dog, Lord, because why? Because you love him. You love him too. And you would take care of him. And, 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 and so I will take whatever you give me, Lord. Please, I need your help, is basically her response. I'm willing to take whatever it is that you're willing to give me because the truth is, is that I'm desperate in this situation. And if it's your will, I want your will for my life. When I, you know, many times we don't get what we're asking for because we're full of lust and we're asking for something that God hasn't given. And when I say lust, once again, I'm talking about a desire for something that's not of the Lord. Look at James chapter four, verses one through three. We're about to close. He says, from where do wars and fightings come from amongst you? Come they not here? This place I'm about to tell you. Even of your lusts, quarrels and fightings come from within. It comes from the lust. Men, men that are at war, nations that are at war with one another, it comes from lust, a desire for something that they're not necessarily always supposed to have. I want your property. I want your oil. I want your goods. I want your stuff. Whenever you get in a fight with someone that you're close to, it's because many times you have a certain desire of things to go a certain way. The other person has a desire for things to go a certain way, and it causes a fight within you. He says... Come they not from here, even from your lust, that you war in your members, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. You can be desperate, but demand something that he won't give, but when your desperation is directed towards his will, 
His blessings are soon to follow. There are two examples of outward actions that we cover. Just a real quick review. Number one, the Pharisees were very focused on the outward appearances of what looked like cleanliness and spirituality. Their pride really was blinding them from seeing the deceptive motives of their heart. That was, that was external religion. That was fake religion. It was an external thing that looked holy to the outside. And many times you and I look at other people and it just looks so holy and it looks so good. But it's really just all external. And there's not the true gospel is not really penetrating their heart and dealing with them. Amen. We can all come to the realization and admit to one another that if the Lord has his way and his word has its way, it's going to reveal to us the things that are in our heart. It's going to show us things that are in our heart. Amen. And the Lord will deal with us. As we move forward, if we're truly his children. But number two, the woman was broken and humbled. That's what we see from her. She was broken. She was humbled. She was desperate. She was desperate for God to do what she needed from him. There was no hiding in pure motives. But most importantly, she was willing to accept his will. Isn't that something? I mean, you know, it's, sometimes it's not that easy to find out what the will of the Lord really is in a situation. And sometimes in situations, we don't really like the will of the Lord. I mean, if we're honest with one another. I mean, we don't like it right now. But she wasn't demanding that she get what she wanted. No, Lord, I got a right. I mean, you talk to a New Testament Christian today, they're like, man, I'm a king's kid. I'm ready to sit at the table. Well, maybe you, but what about her? She was, she was willing to receive what the Lord was offering. Amen.